When Dr. Williams gave a lecture on civil and religious law in England at the Royal Courts of Justice 10 years ago, it attracted a great deal of attention from not only lawyers and people of religion, but also from the general public. The lecture was sophisticated, very sophisticated, and contained the long sentences, in some cases stretching to 10 lines. <laughs> So the Guardian newspaper decided to run a commentary for the general readers. The left-hand column had Dr. Williams' sentences, and the right-hand column gave what the journalists thought the meaning of the sentences could be. <laughs> well, this lecture is not an exception in that it demonstrates Williams' concentrated and profound thoughts on the subject. I must say that I had to read the written draft at least twice carefully in order to understand and to respond to this lecture. Fortunately, in this case, Dr. Williams has actually provided a summary at the end of each lecture. <laughs> so in case if you got lost during the lecture, you only need to revisit the last few paragraphs. <laughs> I'm sure you all follow and you perfect, understand perfectly well, but just in case. <laughs> William's treatment of any subject brings us into his deep theological insight, and we come out feeling much enriched with a sense of the complexity of the topic, and yet we appreciate his profound and deeper level of engagement. So thank you, Dr. Williams, for sharing your careful scholarship with us this morning. What I appreciate most from Dr. Williams' insights in this lecture is twofold. First, having established his idea of close connection between rights language in secular and theological contexts, he expanded further on the notion of right within biblical and doctrinal discussions and touches on the idea of divine justice and divine use. In his clear argument on the divine wisdom in the discussion of rights language, though God doesn't owe us and is not bound by any human request, justice is God's divine pledge and for God's sake, because he is bound to himself. Therefore, we and all creation are called rightly and justly to be seen as worthy of attention, love, and selfless response." Unquote. He also emphasized the importance of the recognition or cultural acknowledgement in this discussion by connecting this with the divine justice. According to his understanding, the close connection between God's justice and right doctrine lies in the just action in which Christ gives his life as the only gift from the finite world that is adequate to what God deserves. I quote him. The second thought or second insight I appreciate is that in his support of Augustine and Aquinas, justice is a divine gift and not a human achievement. So the quote, worshiping church is a community of justice because it worships what alone deserves to be worshiped, the one true and threefold God, unquote. Williams rightly points out that giving to God what is God's right is accomplished in the life and death of Christ and that all receives their right because of God's giving. In his argument for establishing the divine doctrine of right in relation to prevailing secular discussions, Williams argues that recognition of the image of God in each other is vital since the divine image is as much about acknowledging as about claiming use. 
He argues that the recognition of right itself gives the freedom to acknowledge and respond to the right of others. So in my view, he is correct to say that the associating the divine image with the human rights is a demonstration of active ability. Now, while I very much appreciate the theological insights of the lecture, I would like to raise some questions from the points I raised above. First, when relating to justice and Christian community, Dr. Williams mentions that the worshiping community is a community of justice and the worship of God is the center of the concept of rights. I believe that the doctrines of justice and rights should be discussed side by side, but as we learn from the message of the prophets and the epistles, the people of God do not always act justly. It is too much to assume that the church is defined as a community of justice, by quote him. As John de Cruz argues, the prophetic tradition provides the vision for justice for the oppressed, poor, and other victims of the society, so that all people are equally respected as bearers of God's image. And the God of Israel is consistently seen as a God of justice, and his people ought to be just. The prophetic traditions demonstrated that justice is an ultimate theological concern and not only a penultimate moral concern, and that acting justly is the very heart of knowing God. However, that message of justice has to be addressed first to our Christian community because while knowing God's will, we often do not do justice. That these two aspects of knowing and doing do not always go together is perhaps the very heart of the message of the prophets. Acting justly has to start within and from the Christian community, especially so because the Christian community ought to know the justice God requires and God deserves. Justice is, as Williams points out, a divine gift. But doing justice requires our response to that gift. My second point is that discussion of justice and rights should also include the difficulty of deciding how to apply justice and rights between different groups. We did discuss a little bit yesterday. Often what matters is not the content of the idea, but rather its ability to sustain a sense of solidarity toward others and the pursuit of the common good. As Walter Gemelli argues, justice and rights are required in the Hebrew Bible. Justice rights as required in the Hebrew Bible are not the equal treatment of the all members of the society or blind just here. It is understood as an aspect of the divine demand for compassion towards the weak and the poor. Here, the concept of justice in the Hebrew Bible is different from a philosophical concept in that it is never an abstract discourse on the nature of justice or seeking some imagined ideal society. Justice in the Christian scriptures is taking care of the victims of unjust systems, including minorities, the weak, and oppressed. Moreover, it is the natural outcome of a right relationship with God, and indeed, our due to God for what God is, as Williams point out. As far as I can see, the Christian scriptures do not provide a systematic approach to the concept of justice, but prioritize the questions of why justice is important and how to practice it. Third, 
Dr. Williams concludes that Christian theology provides a significant resources for the overall discussion of human rights. I fully agree with that. However, I'm wondering whether his comments are too cautious and whether Christians should boldly say that Christian theology, in spite of different interpretations and emphasis, embodies the notion of rights, not only because of theological understanding of God's nature and the Imago Dei, but also because they are the natural outcome of being in Christ. This can also be asserted on the basis of the socio-political and economic manifestation of Christian churches in history, despite their weakness and shortcomings. We can think of the English Quakers and Evangelicals who campaigned for the Anti-Slavery Act in England, and Mennonites and Quakers in the USA who advocated emancipation of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement, of anti-apartheid movement initiated by Christian church leaders in South Africa and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission led by Desmond Tutu, of Oscar Nomero and his dedication to the poor and fight against the military oppression in El Salvador, and Pandita Ramabai who dedicated her life for the widows and orphans in the North India. These are a few examples of well-known figures, but we do know that there are numerous cases of Christian involvement in defending justice and the rights of others. Lastly, since Dr. Williams mentions the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I would like to point out the Christians played a significant role in establishing this. As we all know, toward the end of World War II, Christian leaders raised concerns about human rights in international politics, and there was a consensus for an international bill of rights, which would have a universal base and be acknowledged by all nations. Christians in the West were actively involved in promoting and drafting the bill. Furthermore, while endorsing the other rights, they insisted on the right of religious freedom, as stated in the Article 18, which affirms the universal right of the freedom to change and to manifest one's religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. By ensuring that religious freedom was counted as an integral part of human rights, Christians provided an anchorage for the human rights discussion in human dignity in the image of God. Dr. Williams urges that we should discuss human rights more carefully and more boldly. He has provided clear and careful hermeneutics for the relationship between the theological doctrine of Eus and Eustachia and the legal and cultural framework for rights. The challenge before us is how do we Christians repent of not giving God his due of justice and right, both as individuals and as a community when the theological mandate is clear to us. Furthermore, how do we boldly demonstrate and practice human rights from a Christian point of standpoint for the sake of justice and the rights of others? I have ventured to make some suggestions along these lines. Thank you once again, Dr. Williams, for your thought-provoking lectures and the challenge you have placed before us. Thank you.